it today. Um, I think it got nicely quiet there, so I think it's a, a good time to start. I'm John Hannan, I'm the Programme Manager for Ambition for Ageing, doing the supporting seminars. Uh, and it's really great to welcome um, Anna Goulding, I think that is your name, isn't it? Yeah. Anna, <laughs> Anna worked on the programme for the last two years, so uh, <laughs> I, I think I, 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 I can recall her. Um, so it's been really good because Anna's been usually the person introducing the seminars when, when we give the uh, when we've had the, the presentation, but now Anna's got a chance to run a seminar. Uh, um, it's on an issue that's uh, certainly close to her heart and uh, the work so far, and it's going to start with a really bad pun, I can see, which I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about, but uh, Anna's going to be talking about um, cultural values, cultural engagement, and, and how that can link into uh, ageing. Um, so, We'll have the seminar, there will be a chance for people to contribute, which is why there's yeah. pens and paper on the table, so it's going to be an active discussion, not that just being uh, talked at. Um, and I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, all of you, for coming um, today. My name is Anna Goulding. Uh, I'm based up at Newcastle University, but um, as John mentioned, I was working on this project for about 17 months. Uh, and can I just say, also, it's a privilege to be back here. I work with some of you, and I know that you're doing really interesting work, and I want to pull from that later on in the discussion. Can I just have a show of hands to see who we've got representing which organisations? Who would describe themselves as working for a cultural organisation? Just so I can think about how to tailor to things to be useful to you. Okay, so we've got, okay. How many people would you say were um, working for voluntary sector organisations with a specific interest in older people? Okay, so that's the majority. And of those, how many of you are actually doing or have done some kind of cultural project? Quite a lot, <laughs> lovely. Have you got anyone from the health sector here? One, two, okay, three here, great. And are there, are there, John, have I missed out any important, have we got any people? Um, older people themselves. Older people themselves. <laughs> just coming from a personal level? And, and this is just, it's just out, out of a personal interest or is anyone actually connected with the project? Lovely. And then any academics here? Great. <laughs> right. Well, hopefully there'll be something for everyone in this. And please do interrupt me if there's anything that you disagree with. So uh, I've been working for a decade um, researching the processes and outcomes of engagement with culture um, on older people. Uh, and today what we're going to do is we're going to debate what we actually mean by culture. Lots of different definitions, lots of arguments about this. We're going to consider who actually gets to engage with that culture we're talking about. We're going to think about um, how we actually measure the benefits. And then on a slide, I want to bring a level of criticality in there when we're thinking about measuring outputs. And then I'm going to take more of a slant and look at the actual research investigating and, um, the well-being benefits and see how that might actually, some of those underpinning ideas might actually help you measure or make the case for um, why we need the public purse to be directed towards um, cultural projects. Uh, I'm going to show you some um, quite fun and inventive projects which might be inspirational um, and I really would like you to tell me about the projects that you're developing and particularly the real, from the practical to the theoretical, what are the problems that you're, you're, you're finding and you know, what do you need from academia, what do you need from different sectors to help deliver your work. Does that sound okay? Right, so first of all, what I'd like us to do is... Now choose your example carefully here because I am going to ask for some examples. Um, but really if we're talking about whether culture is important to us, I want us to play um, Desert Island Culture. I want you to have a think for a moment on your own about an example of a song or a painting or a film. Any piece of art that you saw which made you think differently about things. And I'd like you to really immerse yourself back to when, when you heard that track and it changed something. And I want to think about how old you were, um, where you were, where did you want to be, um, what mood did the artwork invoke, um, did it change the way you wrapped or did you just forget about it, did it change the way you thought, did it stay with you, um, have you revisited it in later life, when you heard it again did it not quite have the same uh, impression on you, and if you hear it now what does that make you think, so just have a minute to think of 
Think of that, because we're trying to get at whether this is important to us or not. Oh, listen, thank you, thank you. Now what I'd like you to do in your group is um, there's some big paper in the middle of the uh, table. I want you to list all the things that you consider as cultural. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that you think is cultural. I'll get some feedback in about a few minutes. Give me three examples. Does that sound okay? And John will start with yours. Uh, 
culture, so this art gallery is here. Um, it's a culture that receives social legislation or institutional support in a given, soci given society. And often it identifies as bourgeois culture. So a set of people have decided what we think is important and we're going to make sure money goes towards that. Uh, and lots of people will think of that in terms of where the funding goes. It's going to be art galleries, museums, classical concerts, theatre and heritage sites. Now obviously this has shifted now and more actual forms of participation are being funded by the Arts Council and also music as well has diversified um, hugely. But you'll find folk music gets much less funding than actual um, classical music. So during austerity, uh, there needs to be a convincing case that the arts are actually valuable to society. And if we're going to have these official cultural institutions that are going to be funded, we need to make sure that everyone is benefiting from them. Uh, and we have to actually show that it is making a difference to people's lives, or not, as the case may be. Now, the, the, the big long-standing debate here about whether we have art for art's sake and the intrinsic value of it, um, or the actual extrinsic value of it, so the external value, in terms of the social benefits to society. Now, the Taking Part survey is, um, is a, a national survey which is done, and it actually shows, because we're talking about older people today here, and it actually shows that those aged 65 to 74 visiting arts, museums, and galleries has actually increased from 2005 to 2014. So that's actually, so for a set of people, they're actually enjoying more uh, engagement. But adults over 75 continue to have a lower engagement rate than any other group. And so we can, we're thinking about physical health, we're thinking about mental health, we're thinking about social isolation, we're thinking about all these issues that this programme is concerned with there. Also, if we actually, also if we actually look at the people of those 55 year olds to 74 year olds, they are disproportionately prosperous, well educated professionals who also visited art galleries when they were younger. So they grow up, grew up knew that this is something to do. The visitors are unlikely to be black or Asian in that age range. And arts participants in particular are most likely to be white. Also, all those people in that group are more likely to enjoy good health. So really, uh, when we're talking about the public purse going towards official cultural institutions, there is a question of equity. And I suppose a lot of us here are trying to make sure that uh, more people can enjoy what we benefit from. Uh, if we actually compare this to other um, survey data, uh, does anyone come to James Nasri's talk last year? Um, well, well, using his data set there, the English Longitudinal Study of um, Aging, they looked at a big data set um, over, over a time period, and they found that actual cultural participation did not change with old age and retirement. So those still coming through are still better educated and healthier and more active than the older age group. And they actually argue that post-retirement, actually participation in, in these cultural activities actually replaces work for settled people. So some people, it's, it's a great opportunity, you're doing more of it than you ever could before. Obviously, that's not the case across the, across the board. So we're really, if you look in academia, really, we're looking at how the unequal distribution of these forms of social participation, it's actually quite a crucial component of social inequality in old age. So it's not only representing the other health inequalities that there are, it's also serving to actually reinforce those um, inequalities. So if you've got a group of people who are using the arts to define their identity, and if the social relationships they get and the cultural knowledge they get is a useful resource, if they can converse in different spheres, um, then that's actually meaning that some people, some people are really benefiting, but some people are missing out. Obviously, uh, it's a period of austerity and arts council budgets have been absolutely slashed. Um, and there's also questions of how money needs to be shared out geographically. For example, we have two opera houses in London. Now, there's an argument there that uh, this brings in tourist revenue, but how much are people from elsewhere subsidizing those opera houses? Uh, also, the other thing is that with the slash, bu slash budget, budgets, pardon me, often it's actually the education or the outreach offered for those kind of roles which are reduced down, and they're the very roles which are actually trying to make um, culture more accessible across socioeconomic and ethnic and gender groups. Okay. So, if we're talking about valuing official culture, I want you to be 
utterly honoured to. I, I'm just picking art galleries because we're actually in an art gallery today. Um, who here has visited an art gallery before this one today? Okay, so that's, that, 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 that's everyone. And that was perhaps a fair, unfair question anyway, because if you hadn't visited, you're gonna, you, you, would, you would feel quite the odd one out in the situation. Um, I want you to actually be quite honest about this. When you, you to visit them, were they boring? Were they great? Was it something you were exposed to when you were younger and you, you, found, uh, and you found it dull, but then you revisited it later in life? What did it make you feel? Uh, what do you associate with it? Um, it? And then in terms of also, so when did you first go? Did you go with school? And then also, if we're looking at actually whether we think it's valuable, but often this is a useful question, would you actually take your children or your grandchildren? Is it something that you think is important for the next generation coming up? So could I ask you just to talk to your partner, perhaps, honestly, about and ask that, what you actually think about art galleries. <laughs> if you don't want to choose art galleries, choose, an, choose another, choose a museum or a heritage site, one of those official ones that I've just been talking about. Is everyone clear of what they've been asked to do? Does that, does that sound okay? Um, visiting an art gallery and what it made them feel and what they associated with it, and it can be negative or positive. I don't want to, in, uh, you know, be so, uh, uh, an advocate necessarily. Oh, Magica uh, or Santa. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. 
they will know anything about any picture in there. Now that's always stuck with me, which is different from what you're saying, that you would just write it and it gave you a feel for it. Yes, and I was given this reason, and that picture called me in the yellow dress, because actually now I'm asking she will not be in your prison for the job. <laughs>
Of, of, of what this being an art gallery you yeah, associate yeah, with it. Yeah. Thank you. So we've got two, we'll have these two more examples and then we'll go on to the next thing.
do that in the official culture, and it is something that you think is better to have than not to, to have. Is, is that, does anyone disagree? I think about um, people visiting in terms of their well-being, and we let people define it. I, I think we as a distance as a research, we're trying to understand what's going on. We're trying to bring a critical element to it, and we're not trying to straightforward advocate. I should say that these slides will be available afterwards, and you can look at my work if you want to see any of this in more detail. If you, if you need to use any of this to make a case for the work you're doing, there's lots of stuff published on this, so that, that won't be a problem. But I am going to rattle through it now. So we were talking about how um, visiting would impact on people's uh, well-being, and we looked at how your social and cultural capital and your identity capital, how they both influenced how motivated you were, and then also what actually happened in the interaction, how you discussed that art, the terms you used, and then what you got out of it afterwards as well. And unsurprisingly, the educated white middle classes brought something very different to people who, who had not benefited from different education, uh, both in terms of the relationships they got out of it and the opportunities. But what was really interesting about this work was, uh, was the groups who had really been um, rejected contemporary art. By the third visit, they were very they were embracing it and learning the language and looking at how other people used the space. So I thought that was very interesting. Within three visits, people who had felt absolutely excluded by the regeneration of the seaside were actually getting something out of it. Um, okay. So now we've been looking, we were thinking really about well-being in older age, and we were thinking about this idea that it seems to be very important, this idea of sort of bouncing back through adversity. So we've just um, put together something um, here, and we've got actually some of the contributors in the room, we're lucky enough to have them, and we were looking at a range of creative or cultural um, projects. Now I'm going to just make sure that I say, say everything so I don't leave anything out. Um, and so we want to not necessarily associate with the arts. So for example, we had um, gardening in there. We had interventions for people in Chile after an earthquake had struck. We had people designing um, housing. Uh, we had participatory theater that, that, that um, um, Mims and Jill sat on, on that. And Jackie did a wonderful chapter on craft. Um, so, uh, so we're really thrilled to, to have them here with us there. And we did some work with dementia as well. Uh, and the reason why we included so many different forms was, was because we were wanting to see what skills those different art forms brought, which might be, people might be able to then apply to different areas of their lives. So, for example, um, the craft in Jackie's chapter, very different, that kind of technical mastery, very difficult, different from the kind of expression art that people might use in another form. And uh, uh, Min and Jill's chapter, looking at participatory theatre, uh, this kind of this real dialogue, you know, creating these meanings, and you know, you would use a voice, the body, the imagination, all those coming together. So, what that might do in terms of helping someone become more resilient. And um, uh, can I just ask if everyone uses the term resilience? One. Okay. Okay. And so, one of the things as well was we were using participa creative participatory methods as well because we wanted to really make sure that all the people themselves, whether they thought it was a, a relevant term or whether they thought it was just quality speak and not at all relevant. So that was one of the important elements of this. So what do we mean by resilience? Well, we, we saw it as a combination of environmental and individual factors. Um, we wanted to see it as a negotiated process rather than as a trait that some people are lucky enough to possess. We see it as something that we can help develop in uh, people. It's, it's not just that some people are tougher than others. We were very interested in the ordinary magic of human adaptation. And a lot of the work on resilience looks at reducing these bits of risk factors. So obviously we need housing which can withhold earthquakes. Obviously we want to actually reduce uh, poverty. We want to try and reduce the risks where possible. But we are also interested in whether people can bounce back despite adversity and perhaps even because of it. So actually having these knocks, how it then actually helps strengthens you as a person. In terms of creativity, we're really seeing this as seeking an original solution to a problem or, or a challenge you have. And we're both looking at two aspects. So how sort of engaging in culture, how that actually might help you thrive in the face of acute stress, or indeed just normal everyday life transitions associated with aging. But then also how you could apply these creative skills to other areas of your life. And not just make you able to cope with these 
design challenges, but give you a sense of, of striving and experience. Now, in terms of the big argument here, I think this is why I started off with what we actually consider as cultural engagement, and we, we, we talk about lots of other forms of social participation, and obviously all forms of social participation uh, are important and bring something. But if we're actually looking at official culture, uh, uh, and you know, why are we going to pay money towards this and not bingo, we need to look at what is actually going on with the actual um, artistic encounter, if you like. And so we see this in, in sociology, a lot of the work can look at the barriers, what, 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 before someone comes, what they bring to them, how that can affect motivation to actually engage. So what we want to do, and just focus on that really, and what we want to do is see both of these coming together. So what the person brings in terms of their experiences, their baggage, whatever, and then what actually happens when they, you know, when they, they meet this artifact, what is it that stimulates this encounter coming together? So that's where we can make the argument about why we're going to support opera as opposed to something else, or what, whatever one you, the group you want to um, choose. And then and I'll just finish off. I was going to say, all this information is going to be on the PowerPoint, and you can ask me about it. But I will wrap up now, because I know that people will want to uh, move around. Um, but this is just one of the projects. So this was in a care home, and really it sees that this the way people actually use their objects, the, the, the choices they made about the objects they brought with them, the choices they made about where they displayed them were very important to their sense of identity. And this is Helen Manchester's work um, down in Bristol. And uh, people were bringing their objects out and actually talking and, and learning about the people's histories. And they also, like our project, we never just want to do reminiscence work, we want to look at moving forward and, and new identities as well. So the top one there, is actually um, a rocking chair which has got some speakers in it and with some of these stories they actually recorded the stories and you can sit in that rocking chair and hear the stories and here we've got an example of someone's um, China dog being 3D printed you can't go into a men's shed these days without a 3D printer <laughs> um, so there was another example so again it was, it was using what people already had and going forward and creating something new um, so I think I'm going to finish there, if it's okay. I'm happy to take any questions uh, under the discussion to continue, and also you can email me um, with, with any questions, and this PowerPoint will be available later. So I hope that's been useful. <laughs> for